This video is going to cover life history evolution, which involves how different organisms invest energy into development, maintenance, and reproduction. Life history studies examine the diversity of how or and when organisms reproduce. And the range here can be astounding. So on the left here, I have an example of thrips. Thrips are insects that have the most bizarre life history characteristics. So in this species, it's what's called ovoviviparous. So the young uh, hatch from eggs, but they stay inside the mother's body. Uh, and usually in that situation, they're then, you know, born to mature and to, to adults, but not in the case of thrips. In the case of thrips, what they do is they mature while they're still inside their mother. But not only that, but they mate while they're inside of their mother. They're highly inbred, so the uh, brothers actually mate with their sisters, and then the sisters will emerge to continue reproduction uh, once they're out of their mother. But they actually feed on the mother before they emerge. So a very bizarre schedule of maturation, hatching, use of energy, and they have very short life cycles, obviously, so they're gonna mature very quickly, and uh, generation time is very low. Contrast, we have over here the brown kiwi and all birds have to lay eggs that they then incubate to, to raise their young but clutch size can vary greatly in birds and brown kiwis have an, an extremely large egg so this is an x-ray of a female that that is her egg that she's about to lay so again this is a different a very extreme life history tactic why have a clutch of one egg and just raise that one offspring and produce such a large egg when most birds may produce a clutch size, so most passerines, for example, may produce a clutch size of five or six eggs, and they're much smaller eggs. So why do different species have these patterns of reproduction? I'll give you some more examples. So why does the rate of maturity and reproduction vary? If you look at a mouse, a mouse generation, within just a few days, a mouse goes from being born to mature and being able to breed on its own versus a bear which may stay with its mom for a number of years before it becomes independent and then maybe even a greater period of time before it is sexually capable. Well, what about lifespan? Why are there some plants that are annuals, like a sunflower? It only lives for one year and it has to do everything in its lifespan to continue the generation in that one year and then it dies. Versus an oak tree that can live for centuries. Well, what about the size of the offspring uh, or the amount of reproductive effort per individual offspring formed? Well, let's just contrast two very closely related groups, two bivalve mollusks, oysters. Individual female oyster can produce 10 to 50 million tiny little eggs. And then they release these into the environment. Most of those aren't going to make it, but some of them do. And that's really the key to this is you know, you're not putting a lot of investment in any one, but if you produce enough, there's a good shot that some of them are going to survive. The opposite strategy in this case would be to produce many fewer eggs, but really put more investment in each individual egg. So a clam may only produce, say, 300 relatively large eggs, and you don't just release them directly into the environment. They actually brood them inside the clam where they then hatch. So it's another example of ovoviviparity the eggs hatch inside of the parent. And so that provides a little bit of parental care and increases the chance that a higher fraction of these are going to live to grow up to be adults. So really what we're talking about here, what life history studies do is they show how species vary in their allocation of energy used for growth, maintenance, and reproduction. So a possum, if we look at the energy source that an individual has throughout its life and what it uses that energy for, when they're young, say up to three months old, they're getting that nutrition from their mother. So they're getting that milk and it's used for growth, metabolism, and repair. At about three months though, then they become independent and they have to forage on their own so they have to gather that energy independently. They have to split that energy for growth, metabolism, and repair. But once they get just a little less than a year old, at about 10 and a half months old, then they become reproductively mature. So now they don't have to invest in growth anymore, but they still have to invest in metabolism and repair, and now they have another energetic expenditure associated with reproduction. 
And for the typical possum, you may reproduce for a year, but you don't even make it into your second year in many cases. So a very short lifespan in uh, some possum populations. We will show you another example of a population of possums that have different ecological circumstances and how those different ecological circumstances affect their life histories. So keep that in mind as we move forward. In sand crickets, within a population, there can be two different life history strategies shown by different females. Some females put a lot of investment into growing their reproductive capacity at the cost of the growth of wings. Other females may not be able to produce as many eggs eventually when they mature, but they have wings. Well, you may be thinking, well, if the evolutionary goal of all organisms is to pass on as many your genes as possible, the short-winged females appear to be doing the best strategy. That should sweep to fixation in the population and should be the best strategy because they should outcompete the long-winged individuals as far as fecundity, the number of eggs that they can produce. But see, it depends on the environment in which they find themselves. So a short-winged female, if you look at the pr proportion of her energy that she allocates to the production of flight, again, she's not doing that. She's allocating that all for reproduction. But she can, if in a high food situation, she can produce lots of eggs, in a low food situation, she can't do very much. A long wing female, on the other hand, because they're putting more energy into the production of flight capabilities, compared to an individual that is short winged, in all of these equivalent food situations, they can't produce as many eggs. So you may be thinking here, well, clearly then it looks like the short winged females have the advantage. But what if the food is so low that it doesn't allow for both maintenance of your self and the reproductive potential of maturing eggs? In that situation, a long-winged female would have the capacity to leave that extremely poor habitat that wouldn't allow you any reproductive success and would decrease your chances of even survival. And so this is a, what we call a, a risk-averse strategy. This is a risk-prone strategy. Short-winged females, they're stuck at where they're born. They can't move to a different habitat if there's a food failure. The long-winged females, in a, if they're raised in a very variable environment where seasonally resources are unpredictable, and some years you have good food and some years you have bad food in a local microhabitat, they can escape that and actually have some reproductive success. So in a highly variable population, some years the short-winged females do better, other years they have absolutely no reproductive success, and the long-winged females do better. So both of these life history strategies can exist in the population. Well, one interesting topic in studies of life history involves senescence. Senescence is a linkage between a typical decline in reproductive capacity as an individual gets older and an increased probability that they're going to die as they get older. Well, this doesn't seem like a very good thing for your fitness, right? Why can't you just live forever and continue to reproduce at a high rate? Senescence limits fitness, so why isn't there selection pressure to make it where you don't lose reproductive capacities and you don't have an increased chance of dying because of old age, because of of some decline in physical health. Well, here are three examples of, of organisms and showing you how as they age, they change in their reproductive capacity, and that's what's shown in the left column here. The right column is not actually showing the exact same thing, so notice that the, the y-axes are a little different in each of these cases, so we'll come to that in a minute. But let's first just look at how reproductive capacity changes with age in birds, some birds, this is a relatively flat curve, but they may have higher reproductive success kind of at midlife, and there's a some decline in reproductive capacity as they get older. It's not a huge pattern, but that it is seen in some birds. Here we have an example in elk or red deer where there's a difference between sexes in their reproductive capacity with age. You see that the females have pretty consistent 
reproductive capacity at a wide range of dates. There may be a little bit of decline in reproductive capacity as they get really old into the age of like late teens. But from the males, wow, look at this. Intermediate age, they have huge reproductive success. But once they lose that peak health, their reproductive capacity drops really quickly. And when they're very young, it's not very high. Let's look at fl uh, fruit flies, Drosophila. You see that they have low reproduction early on, but as they mature, they rapidly develop high fecundity. But then there's a steady decline of that as they age. And here we're just talking about in days, not years, just days. Well, how are these things linked to survival? Most birds don't have a, a decrease, a steady decrease in survival as they age most passerines at least. There may be a slight pattern of senescence late in life, but it's relatively flat. And this is because birds, most small birds, experience a high rate of what we call ecological mortality. Uh, they die from being killed by predators or uh, something in nature, not their physical condition itself. Now that's not the case here, which we see with the elk. Females, as they get older, Yes, they do have a pretty sharp decline in, in later years as far as their uh, probability of survival. Males, it's even steeper. Once they lose this physical peak in which they're at their reproductive peak, they rapidly lose their probability of surviving. For the flies, there's an early period where it's fairly level that's associated with maximizing reproductive success, but then there's a steady decrease. So in at least two of these cases here, what we're going to see is there's a pretty good linkage between once you lose your capacity for reproduction, there's a steep decline in, in survivorship. Same thing here. So this is your peak reproductive years. You have pretty good survival early during that time period, but then it drops uh, precipitously. Um, notice that these are on different scales here, so it, it makes it a little different, difficult to compare those. But that's why this looks like it's it's going down faster than over here, but this is just a, a finer scale. So let's address this question. Why can't organisms just evolve to the point where they stay healthy through, through a much longer period of life until they are killed by something? And why don't they just have maximum reproductive capacity throughout their life and not have some decline like we see in the elk here um, once you have lower reproductive success, there's a linkage between that and your chances of survival. Why doesn't natural selection fix this? I'm going to talk about several hypotheses that would explain senescence and the evolution of senescence. The first is what's called the rate of living uh, theory or hypothesis would be a better term for it. The idea here is that aging is simply a result of the accumulation of cell damage. So we have errors in replication and transcription and translation and also the accumulation of toxins that are the byproducts of metabolism, oxidative stress. And the idea here is that natural selection has basically done everything it can to limit this damage. That we're at just our, our physiological limit and organisms just lack genetic variation to evolve a more efficient system to repair and keep um, senescence from occurring. Well, there are two predictions associated with this rate of living theory. And if you actually look at the data, there's really not much support for it. So one prediction would be that your, your rate of aging would be correlated to your metabolic rate. So if you live fast, you die young. If you have a slower metabolism, you might be able to survive longer. But that's not the case. If you look at lifetime energetic expenditures among different groups of mammals, they should all have the same lifetime energetic expenditure, but you don't see that. You see that there's a lot of variation between different groups. So at least in this regard, the data do not support the rate of living hypothesis. The second prediction is that um, if natural selection really has done everything it can do because there's not genetic variation, you shouldn't be able to, through an artificial selection or truncation selection experiment, increase the lifespan of, of a group. And experiments show that that's not the case, that you can increase the lifespan through artificial selection in things like fruit flies. So what they did, this uh, figure is showing you if you just let them breed at random, 
you really don't see any change in their longevity uh, from generation to generation. There's a little bit of change here, but that again is just due to genetic drift. Here we do see two uh, lines that were experimentally manipulated so that they only let flies breed when they reached kind of middle age. And in that situation, some of the individuals had already died, and so we're seeing selection for only those individuals that can reproduce at later age. That led to the selection for longevity and longevity to increase because, and this is crucial, because that was linked to an ability to breed. If you, if you limit their ability to breed early, then individuals that can only live for a short period of time are not going to pass on their genes and the genes for uh, that low survivorship. Only individuals that can survive for a longer period of time and reproduce can pass on those longevity genes and we see that you can select for a longer lifespan. So again, the rate of living theory doesn't really seem to hold water. Well, I'm going to talk now about two theories associated with aging. The first is called the mutation accumulation hypothesis. And the idea here is that mutations that specifically cause problems late in life, those can accumulate because they are relatively hidden from natural selection's impacts. So here we have a figure that, that kind of just shows you artificially how this could impact a population. Let's say that we have uh, two different lineages. One lineage you breed at the three-year-old and then you live for 16 years. And once you start breeding, you have the same reproductive. So in this case, it's kind of simplified by saying there's no senescence associated with reproductive capacity, but you can see that there is senescence associated with survivorship. And that's what's on the x-axis here. So if you uh, look at the fraction of individuals surviving, there's a steady decline in that, but they do live to, to age 16. But look at the few number of individuals that actually live that long. Not very many. Yeah, they're having fairly good reproduction, but they're really not contributing much to the population's gene pool. Well, what if we have the same maturation rate and the same degree of reproductive success throughout ages but now you die at age 14 instead of age 16. So you're taking off two years of your life. How is that gonna affect the population uh, of this species? And that's basically what's shown by this purple area of the curve. Notice they're really similar. Because really all you're doing is you're cutting off that little tail there. So the expected lifetime reproductive success of an individual that lives 16 years with the same maturation rate is 2.419. It is less here because you die uh, in, uh, at the age of 14 instead of 16, but it's really not changing that much. Most of the individuals that are contributing to the gene pool are breeding early. The impact of this is there's not going to be strong selection pressure on these few individuals that live long. They're not really contributing that many genes overall to the population, so if they do have genes that could keep them alive longer, that keep them from dying of age-related diseases, that's not going to really impact the population that much because more of the individuals are contributing their genes in an earlier stage. So what kind of mutations are we talking about? These mutations that contribute to an increased chance of dying only late in life. Well, think about most cancers. Most cancers only affect individuals one, that have stopped reproducing. They're no longer reproducing, so there's going to be no selection to keep those genes. And even if you were capable of reproducing, the, the difference between the number of individuals that survive is going to be just a, a fraction of the total population. So there's not going to be strong selection against those mutations. They will accumulate, therefore, in the population because they're not tightly linked to a large amount of reproduction in the population. And we can actually do an experiment to show that if you restrict reproduction at late in life and you only allow individuals to breed early in life, you actually cause the evolution of a reduced lifespan. So both in males and females, in large populations and small populations in a study of fruit flies, 
they started off with females having this degree of longevity, males having this degree of longevity, but you only let them mate in their first four to five days. So when they're relatively young and they've just matured, then you cut off their potential. You separate them by sex into male and female groups. And what we see is generation after generation, there isn't in this case selection to keep individuals alive. The normal flies in these populations would be able to continue to breed many more days. But in this situation, um, if you're so into the 20s and the 30s, but if you're only allowing them to breed in days four through five, that will allow mutations to start accumulating that will kill individuals in this time frame because they can no longer breed during this time frame. So there's no real reason to live that long from an evolutionary point of view. If, if we take away that reproductive potential artificially in flies of this age, uh, they will start to accumulate mutations that would uh, lead to death at those ages. The other evolutionary theory associated with aging and senescence is called the antagonistic pleiotropy hypothesis. This is one that I really like. The idea here is that if you get a mutation that affects reproduction, it may also affect your lifespan. The, this is what pleiotropy is. Pleiotropy is when you have a single gene that has multiple effects. So if you have a mutation that decreases the age at which you become mature so that you breed earlier, well, it also might be linked to causing you to die earlier. There may be an evolutionary trade-off associated with how early you reproduce and how long you can live. So in this situation, let's say that the difference here is, here we have our typical situation I showed you earlier. You mature at age three and you live to 16. Well, what if you mature one year earlier at year two? Well, in this situation, the consequence of that is you may die at 10 instead of 16. So you're taking 16 years off of your life. But remember, individuals, more individuals will be alive at age two than the combined ages way down here. And so from a population standpoint, there's gonna be greater influence of those individuals that are breeding earlier than those individuals that may wait a year and have really reduced sur survivorship and uh, contribute very little reproductively to the entire population uh, late in life. So if you compare the lifetime reproductive success of these two different strategies, yeah, actually breeding earlier is, is the better reproductive strategy if you can pull it off, even if it ends up costing you a, a lifespan, a significant decrease in your lifespan. Here's an example of, of a study in which different individuals within a species have different strategies as far as when to first reproduce and how it affects their reproductive capacity across their lifetime. And in this example, if you breed too early, yeah, you have some big time costs associated with that. Here we have collared flycatchers, many of which breed at age one. Some individuals may wait a year, but once they do reproduce, they tend to have much higher clutch sizes. And so there's a trade-off here between breeding earlier having smaller clutches throughout your life and those associated with waiting one year and being able to, in each subsequent year, reproduce more efficiently with greater numbers. Now to test that this really was associated with the stress associated with breeding too early that may limit your capacity to lay eggs in the future, they took individuals in a single year that had comparable clutch sizes, at least naturally, some of which they just you know, manipulated, handled the eggs, and uh, these were the controls. They didn't really change the clutch size to see throughout their lifespan how that just really no true manipulation, how their clutch size changed throughout their life. And you see that you get this initial bump after the first year, but then it stays relatively flat. And that's basically what's shown early on here. There's a little bit decline here, but this, these, these two are comparable. But what happens if in some groups you steal an egg and add it to an individual? Well, what that does is it increases their workload and their cascading effects throughout the rest of their life. 
you gave them that one extra egg that one year in subsequent years they they're behind the eight ball they're just not in as good a condition they haven't been able to recover from that and they actually lay substantially smaller clutches so this there does appear to be this trade-off associated with early reproduction associated with lower lifetime reproductive success or the capability of laying um, a number of eggs in a year compared to those individuals that may wait. So in, in some species, early reproduction is going to be beneficial. In other species, it may be too costly. All right, let's get back to our possum example. Possums exist in different populations, some of which face less what we call ecological mortality. So they may have fewer predators, for example. If that's the case, they may live long enough for selection to impact their fitness-related traits later in life. If you are killed by a predator early in life, there is no potential for selection to live later. It can't be linked to your reproductive rate late in life. Well, Steve Austad of Yale University did a study on two different populations, a mainland and an island possum population. The island possums didn't face predators, so they face less ecological mortality, they live longer, and they reproduce longer. That's significant because that also led to selection to keep them healthier when they're older because if you can stay healthier later in life, you have better reproductive success. So that's, that's what leads to these selection pressures for being healthier. The linkage of your health being related to the potential to breed late in life. And here are data from this study and it shows you just the lifespan, the sur survival of the mainland versus the island population. And you see for the mainland species, once you get past, you know, um, just, just around two years or less, you have this really drop off in your likelihood of surviving. Um, and usually don't make it past 28, 29 months. Island populations, it's a much less steep decline and they can live to almost four years. So almost twice the lifespan. Well, how is this related to health? As I mentioned, the island populations tended to have selection to keep them healthier. What's the indication of that? Well, they did a kind of bizarre study to use a surrogate for how healthy you were that involved kind of how arthritic the tissues of the possums were in the two different populations. They took the tails and they stressed them to look at their breaking point where the fibers would break. And it takes a lot more pressure at, at specific ages to get the tail of a mainland species to break. And that's because they become ossified, basically. They become very hardened, hard to break. The island tail, possum tails, tended to be more flexible, less rigid, but individual fibers could break more easily because they weren't so arthritic and, and ossified. So that was an indication that the island population at the different ages was remaining healthier. So if you look at the total litter mass in the mainland population you see that they put a lot into that first year. The few individuals that do survive the second year they have much lower reproductive success. Well why don't they, why don't they have reproductive success at this level? Well th there's a trade-off here. Remember it's not guaranteed you're even going to make it to the second year so most individuals put a lot of reproductive effort into that first year and if they do happen to survive into the second year they just can't pull it off at that same level. So possums on the island population are showing intermediate levels of reproduction compared to the mainland populations but there's something else here notice that the difference between years is negligible I mean it's basically the same reproductive rate in both years and that's because of that intermediacy they are healthier they're not trying to do too much in the first year. They have the potential to live longer, and so they're able to reproduce at an intermediate rate, but over multiple years. That's something that the mainland populations haven't been selected to do because of the higher ecological mortality they face and the fact that they haven't evolved to be healthier. New topic, so let's talk about what is the appropriate number of offspring that you should have to maximize your fitness? 
An ornithologist by the name of David Lack, a British ornithologist, came up with much of this initial theory. And Lack's idea was that birds should lay the number of eggs that would be associated with the maximum number of surviving offspring they would produce. That seems to make perfect sense. So if you look at a clutch size and you see this relationship that big clutches have low probability of uh, individuals surviving, so you may be thinking, oh, that's because they're too small, they're going to fledge at too under uh, weight, so they have a low probability of surviving. Well, just lay one egg. Boy, you can put a lot of investment in that egg, you can really take care of that young, so it's going to have the maximum survival rate. Well, probably somewhere along that continuum is an intermediate, a best case scenario where you're producing eggs that are just big enough to produce really healthy young that will survive, most of them will survive, that will maximize how many surviving young you have in that nest. And that weeds what we would call the optimal clutch size. And if you take these numbers, the, the data shown in this graph up here, the relationship of number of survivors by clutch size, and you take each of these clutch sizes and multiply by the probability of survival, you get the likelihood that you're going to get that number of young produced in the nest. So at a clutch size of 1, it's 1 times 0.9. Okay, that's just under 1 right there. For 2, we got 2 times, it looks like 0.8, so that should be about 1.6. Come down here, sure enough, 1.6. So by looking at this curve, we can look at the peak. And the peak here appears to be right at a clutch size of 5. If you lay five eggs, five eggs times about 0.5 is going to give you two and a half. So half of the young should survive if you lay five eggs. That's the idea here. That is your, should be your best option for maximizing the number of young you can produce and through fitness, uh, direct fitness, maximize your fitness or that nest. This seems to make sense. But here's the deal. If you start actually collecting data on a number of bird species in the field and you look at what their clutch sizes are, you see something like this. So this is a study on great tits, uh, birds very similar to our chickadees and tit mice here in North America, but they're European. You see that they show a range of clutch sizes, but then if you look at how that corresponds to the number of young you can actually produce per clutch, most of the individuals in the population are laying between eight and nine eggs right that's that's the peak right up here so why aren't they laying more because if you look at the likelihood of producing more young per clutch that seems to be associated with say 12. why haven't so that doesn't that seem like that should be leading to directional selection to push that to the right so that more individuals lay clutches of 12 because they're producing more offspring right well, here's the problem. The clutch sizes are lower than the apparent optimum because there's trade-offs in reproductive effort. Remember, current reproductive effort may negatively correlate to future reproductive potential. So if you try to do too much in one year, so your current reproductive effort is really high, it will limit your ability to maybe even survive the winter. But if you do, you're going to be in a lower state. And so your next year's potential reproductive is going to be low. Certainly if you don't put much effort this year, your chances of survival are really high and your reproductive potential next year would be really high. But probably there's an intermediate here associated with maximizing your current reproductive effort without harming your future reproductive effort. And so what studies have shown is that most birds will lay just under the optimal clutch size for a single nesting attempt because they're not trying to just maximize nest success for that one nest, they're trying to maximize lifetime reproductive success over a number of nests. And so like in the previous example, remember, this is the per nest optimum, but if you try to do that, you're not gonna live very long or your next clutch is gonna be much smaller and less successful. But if you just undershoot that, at say uh, eight and a half on average, between eight and nine, that's what would lead to the optimum lifetime reproductive success. And that's what the data show. Individuals that produce eggs in that range live longer and have the greatest lifetime reproductive success.
And just to demonstrate that if you try to raise too many at one time, there are some energetic physiological costs associated with that. It's not only true that it has a negative impact on the mom, uh, typically, sometimes the dad as well. So the parents may suffer future reproductive success that's lower. But the offspring that are actually born in large clutches, because they hatch with greater competition, they fledge, they leave the nest when they're lighter. And so they're kind of initially got a setback in life where it reduces their chances of survival and it hinders their future reproduction. And so they did a study to test this idea by artificially taking away eggs from a clutch or adding eggs to the clutch to make it more stressful. And then look at the future reproductive success of the females that were produced, so the daughters that were produced in these clutches. And sure enough, if you if those females grew up with lots of competition with extra large clutches, their future reproductive success was reduced. If you raise them in an, in an environment that's pretty cushy, there's actually less than average competition, their reproductive success in the future is actually higher. So again, there's going to be some intermediate along here that is going to maximize both their reproductive success and that of their parents initially. So that was a way to kind of examine what is the optimum number of offspring produced. What about how do you look at the optimal offspring size? So do you produce very few large offspring or do you produce lots and lots of small offspring? Which of these life history strategies is likely to maximize your fitness? And we tend to see these relationships. So each of these represents different fish families, and we see that there's a range of some that have small eggs. And if you produce small eggs, boy, you can sure produce a lot of them. If you produce big eggs, you can't produce very many at all. So we have this negative relationship between clutch size and egg size. Same thing over here. We got egg volume down here on the x-axis number of eggs that you can produce in different flies. And again, if you produce small eggs, you can produce lots of them. If you produce big eggs, you can't pull that off. You have to produce fewer. But again, which of these is going to maximize reproductive success? Well, that's going to vary from species to species in the ecological conditions they find themselves. But for an individual species, you could look at those relationships to figure out what intermediate is the best. And again, what we're looking at is a trade-off between these two different life history characteristics. And the shape of these two curves are gonna determine what is optimum. So if we look at the relationship of the size of individual offspring on both of the, these x-axes, and how they relate to both the number of offspring you can produce and the survival probability of the individual offspring, then we can see how that size of individual offspring relates to the fitness. And similar to how we were looking for optimal clutch size relationships to fitness, we're going to take this data and combine it with this data to get us this curve. So one, so if you produce really small individuals, their survival probability is, is really small, but boy, you can sure make a lot of them. So at size class one, well, that's at zero, so zero times 10 is going to get you zero. But the next number over here, that looks like it's about 0.1, maybe a little more than that, times nine. So that's going to be just under one. So boom, there we are. We put that dot there. The next one, three here, the third one over is 0.2 times eight. So 1.6. There we go right there. And so you just build this curve. And for this species, given this relationship of the size of individuals to both number you can produce and the individual survival, this right here appears to be the optimum size. Size class looks like around, you know, a little over two. And it's important for you to understand how to do this because I'm going to have a question or two on the exam that deals with calculating this curve for optimal offspring size. And also you need to do the same thing with optimal clutch size. And these curves are gonna change for different species. So let's look at a specific example of how this relationship affects offspring size in uh, Chinook salmon. Now these salmon are raised in hatcheries and they also exist in the wild, but if you look at the data from hatchery raised salmon, you see the typical 
thing that we would expect, a negative relationship between egg number and size. So the larger the egg, the fewer you can produce. That's what fecundity is, the number of eggs. So if you produce small ones, you can produce more. Big ones, you can produce fewer. So there is a range within this single species. Well, what about how does size relate to survival? The bigger you are, the greater your survivorship. The smaller you are, the, the less likely you are able to survive. So we have these counterbalancing forces. Negative slope here, positive force here. There's going to be some intermediate that is likely the best. So if you take these data to calculate that, you get a curve like this. And it's a relatively flat curve, but you see that this is kind of the best part of that curve. So this is the peak of this where you start to see a downturn here and a downturn here. This is the equilibrium egg mass. This is the egg mass associated with the highest maternal fitness. Smaller eggs in that reduces fitness, bigger eggs in that reduces fitness. Well, if you think about the history of these salmon that were used to start this hatchery, they came from the wild. And it turns out if you look at the earliest populations that were brought in here, the females were laying eggs that were bigger than this optimum. But over the years, the population is beginning closer and closer to this optimum. Well, why weren't they here to start with? Why were these wild-caught fish that were used to establish the population bigger than this? Well, it turns out that the hatchery is just a relatively safe place. And so in a hatchery, relatively small-sized fry, the young fish, have higher survivorship than they would in nature. In a natural setting, it's actually better to be bigger. But in a hatchery situation, because it is safer, and you can have high survivorship with smaller fish, make your eggs smaller so that you can produce more of them. So we see that hatchery egg size throughout the years of establishment of this hatchery has been decreasing to production of smaller and smaller average size eggs in the hatchery. The purpose of this hatchery, however, is to raise fish that you can then restock habitats in nature. You go to specific rivers and you introduce these into the population to buffer the size of these populations, increase the size of the population. And different locations have received different numbers of these hatchery raised fish. And the percentage of the population that you're changing by adding these fish, we see that that matters to the evolution of those local populations. If you add just a few, you don't see through time much of a change in egg volume. The egg volume is about the same here, maybe a slight de decrease here, but once you're adding a substantial number of hatchery raised fish into these natural populations, you are affecting their evolution. You're leading to the production of smaller eggs. Now, that's actually significant from a conservation point of view. And this is an, a really an artificial and negative consequence of raising them in a different environment from which they would naturally be found. Again, the hatchery is safer, but when you introduce these genes into the population, now they're producing eggs that are too small to really be the perfect adaptive size for the survival of the maximum number of fry in nature. So we've got a counterbalance for what's going for natural selection in the natural habitat and gene flow with fish coming from the hatchery. And this is just important information if you're a conservation biologist to say, huh, we need to change that somehow. We need to make the size of the eggs somehow uh, the selection pressure in the hatchery to keep them more adaptive when we're, they are released back into nature. When we were talking about social evolution, we talked about how there can be conflicts of interest between individuals in social settings. There can also be life history conflicts of interest relative to reproductive effort between males and females. When males are faced with the potential of multiple paternity associated with the females they're mating with, they're in a competitive venture with trying to maximize the number of young she raises that are his versus those competing males. But from the female's perspective, she wants to keep all of those offspring alive and doing well. So in those situations, a mother is equally related to all of her young, so she should try to even out the nourishment and chances that they will all survive. But from an individual male's perspective that has fathered some of those young, he wants her to invest more into his kiddos, even if it's at the expense, and maybe even especially if it's at the expense 
of those competing offspring in which he has no none of his paternal genes in those offspring. So here's just a summary of what I'm talking about. Here we have the male tactic. If you are the gray male and you're competing against this male, these other two males indicated by the other colors here, if you've all mated with this female and she's produced multiple paternity, she's produced young with more genes than just yours from the paternal aspect, those offspring that are yours, you want somehow to trick her into investing more nutritional resources in their growth at the expense of the competing male's offspring. But for the female's perspective, she wants to invest equally in them. Well, this introduces a biochemical tug of war that you can see evolving in these situations. This is called genomic imprinting. Males produce a stimulant at one gene lo locus associated with insulin-like growth factor two that ramps up the metabolism associated with their offspring. So they're basically saying, okay, my kiddos, I've given you these genes, grow, 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 really fast. So they have really high metabolism. Now see, this holds, could potentially hold the female hostage because she would then have to divert more resources to those individuals that are growing quickly, maybe at the expense of the other young if those males didn't have that allele for faster growth. But we have a situation where females have co-evolved in this competitive arms race, a counter allele that leads to the activation of a type two receptor that binds with this insulin-like growth factor that the offspring of these sons are producing. So before these chemicals can increase the metabolism of certain offspring, the females are producing these chemicals that inhibit the action of those uh, male-induced chemicals. So we have the evolution of this biological tug of war between the males trying to speed up their kiddos and the females trying to counter that so that all of the young develop at the same rate. Here's another example of sexual coevolution in an, a biochemical tug of war and arms race between males and females. In fruit flies, males oftentimes are in competition with other males through indirect male-male competition. So multiple males may be mating with a female. And so the males have evolved seminal fluid that can reduce the likelihood that a female will remate. It does this because it's toxic. It increases the chance that the female will die sooner and it makes her more likely to say, oh, well, I've got this male sperm. I don't think I'm gonna live very long. I better reproduce these kiddos right away, not mess with mating anymore. Well, that's probably not in the female's best interest. That has led to the female evolving countermeasures to be resistant to the negative effects of this toxic seminal fluid. And there was a really cool experiment where they tested the potential evolution of both the toxicity of the male seminal fluid and the ability of females to evolve chemical resistance to its effect. So in this study, they had several lines of males some males in extreme competition so that there were lots and lots of males per female in a vial. So there was lots of competition with other males for paternity. And what we should see here is the selection for extreme seminal fluids. So that the first male that mates with the female, if he can make her sick enough where she can't mate again, that's actually in his best interest. Well, again, in those situations, you should also see that the females should evolve greater resistance to that toxicity. But females that are raised parallel in, a, in populations where there's monogamous relationships, where there's not this male -male, extreme male-male competition, they shouldn't have any coevolution for resistance to the toxicity of this seminal fluid. You should, there wouldn't be any counter adaptations in that context. Well, you can take the flies from each of these studies and mate them to see what effects you've been able to create. So we've got two lines of males. We've got the selected males that are in competition and then the unselected males that are in not extreme competition. And you raise them for a number of generations and you use the unselected males as basically just the baseline. So what is their fitness? And you see that their fitness really isn't changing through time. But if you look at the baseline reproductive success of these unselected males, when they're in competition with the selected males, they don't stand a chance. The selected males that are evolving more toxic seminal fluids are having higher fitness. So this is based on the assumption that these selected males are evolving more toxic seminal fluids. So how did they test that? So they took males from each of these lines and mated them with females that had been raised 
without co-evolution with the high competitive males. So females that had been raised in more of the monogamous situation. And what we see is that these seminal fluids are toxic even in the unselected males to some degree, but it was much worse associated with those in the selected males. This indicates that we did see the creation of more toxic seminal fluids, and we, we saw that the females, if they were raised in a less competitive male-male competitive situation, they didn't co-evolve that resistance. Now, the, another aspect of this study was if you look at the flies where only monogamous matings occurred, well, what should be our ex expectation for seminal fluid evolution then? Well, in this situation, we, they saw what you would expect. The seminal fluid should actually evolve to become less harmful over time because that male only has one female to mate with. He doesn't have to worry about competing males. His main concern now is keeping her healthier longer so that she can produce more offspring. He's limited now on his additional mating options with other females. So the longer he can keep her healthier, um, the higher her fitness, but also linked to that is his fitness. The next video is going to cover different concepts of what makes a species a species, different species definitions, and also how species form, which is the process of speciation.